Film three, take six. Fate plays a big part in any war. I imagine there are one or two instances where you were glad uh, fate treated you kindly. Yes, oh, a number of instances, I'd say. But the first I remember clearly was at the end of 1964, when I'd been there less than a year in Vietnam. And that was before the Americans arrived. And it was the first set-piece battle, you'd say, involving several thousand troops. And both the South Vietnamese and the Viet Cong took quite considerable casualties. Uh, but after the battle had been going uh, for three or four days, the South Vietnamese troops prepared to move into a rubber plantation uh, very late in the afternoon. The sun was going, going down. And um, I decided not to go, because in a rubber plantation there's a heavy canopy, so the light is bad. And uh, I just didn't want to spend uh, a full day tramping through that, you know, 36 hours or something. So I didn't go. Uh, the next morning, they helicopter me, uh, took me in by helicopter to exactly the same position uh, to film the remnants of that battalion. Well, it was about uh, 430 strong, I remember, and 28 survived. They were ambushed in the rubber plantation, and there was nothing uh, the South Vietnamese Air Force could do to help them because they couldn't see them in, under the canopy and they were wiped out. Mm. Do you think you cover wars for war's sake? Oh no, I don't think that. Um, it's certainly uh, exciting, you could see adrenaline flowing, but, um, but I think it's worthwhile because the truth must be presented to the people and after all it's a journalist's job and cameraman's job to bring the truth to the people, uh, they have that uh, obligation, the same as doctors do and other people in various professions. Uh, so I believe that uh, the presentation by the press of the Indochina War, while it left quite a lot to be desired in some respects, uh, did bring it home to the people for the first time ever, I think so that they could see it in their living rooms. And that wasn't very nice sometimes for them and their families. However, uh, it made them aware of, of the war and uh, of the ugly side of war, and the devastating things that can happen to people. There are other wars, other revolutions going on that equally needed to be covered, exposed to the outside world. Why did you stay with Vietnam for nine years? Well, I stayed with it for more than nine years. stayed with it for 11 years. but. Uh, that was because I think it was the most significant war of the period, probably the most significant war since World War II, because it was a, a clash of, it was an ideological clash on the mainland of Asia. Uh, of course, the other reason was that I built up many friendships with the Vietnamese and Cambodian people uh, and Laotian people. You say that uh, it was an ideological clash. Do you think uh, there are elements of racism in the war? Yes, at times there were. Uh, the American soldiers, and there were over half a million American soldiers there for some years, uh, didn't really understand the Vietnamese, and that wasn't their fault. It's that they hadn't been indoctrinated enough, or, nor did they come in close contact with the sort of Vietnamese that I did. They came into contact with a lot of the less desirable elements, like the pimps and the prostitutes and the, uh, the people who made money uh, on the, by the American presence. Is this, they, is this the reason why the American soldiers didn't have much respect for the South Vietnamese? Yes, that's a very strong reason because, as I say, they came into contact with the less desirable elements. They didn't really meet very often the hard-fighting soldiers of the South Vietnamese Army, simply because the South Vietnamese Army were fighting under their own leaders, under their own units in the field, that while they might be supporting the Americans or vice versa, they were never actually uh, integrated with them, of course. So the American soldier n rarely ever met a Vietnamese soldier. And similarly, the American correspondents, their image of them being not good soldiers because they didn't really cover the war with no, them. No, well, of course, the interest back in America was, was what are our boys doing, the Americans. And for several years, they only covered the Americans. I covered the Vietnamese and the Americans, but mainly the Vietnamese. Uh, ideology and the clash on, on in the Vietnam War, was it simply communism versus capitalism? Yeah, that's a simple way to put it, I suppose. Uh, that in the broad sense is true. In the other sense, it was 
uh, a people emerging from a certain system of feudalism as well and gaining independence and freedom and uh, it, it, it's, it's something that's happened throughout the world uh, since World War II. Of course it was brought on mainly a lot by World War II in Asia by the uh, success of the Japanese against the colonialists. Were, you, you, were your sympathies with the North? And, uh, no, I had no, because uh, for a start, professionally, I was tried to remain completely neutral. And there were, my sympathies were with the Vietnamese people, and that's that whether they were Northerners, Southerners, Communist or non-Communist, uh, they all faced similar hardships. Back in the bars with other journalists, you didn't take any particular side? No, that, there might be discussions and arguments about certain facets and sometimes I'd find myself arguing for the South Vietnamese side, the anti-communist side. Other times I might uh, find that the argument was just as strong for the other side, depending on the situation. Nothing is black and white. Was there any way that America could have won that war? Uh, no way that America could win the war because it wasn't their war to win. The, it may have had a different result. Uh, I'm sure it would have, if the Americans hadn't involved themselves in the inner ground war, because they didn't know how to fight it, and they only made certain by their presence that the communists won. The, the B-52 bombings of the North, did that bring the North Vietnamese to the conference table yes, in it, Paris? Yes, it brought them to the conference table in early 1973. Uh, it didn't make any difference to the outcome of the war, really. Uh, but by that time, the Americans had employed their sophisticated bombing, that is laser-guided uh, bombs and camera-guided bombs, which really, after four or five days, uh, wiped out all resistance in North Vietnam, that is, wiped out the uh, surface-to-air missile sites, wiped out the strategic bridges, and uh, the North Vietnam had little alternative but to negotiate at that stage. There was quite a... Uh uh, a bit of opposition initially in the first three or four days of that bombing campaign. Oh, very heavy. The uh, opposition from the ground was heavy because the North Vietnamese also had the most sophisticated uh, anti-aircraft system that had been used against an enemy. Of course, the American and Russian systems are probably more sophisticated, but they haven't had to be used against an enemy. So we uh, saw not only the heaviest bombing of all time by the most sophisticated bombers, but the strongest resistance of all time uh, by, by the um, communist weapons. It was the most sophisticated weaponry, weaponry used in any war. Can you give me any examples? Oh, there were so many examples. There was the bombing and the counter to the bombing. There was a thing uh, the Americans employed in the, in the South called the people sniffer. Uh, that was <laughs> what we called it. It was a, a machine which was carried on a usually a helicopter or a low-flying aircraft over jungle areas and it responded to the body temperature of a man, whatever it is, 98.6 or whatever it is. Um, of course that didn't always work out. Many a times they went scorching in and attacked and bombed and strafed only to find that they'd wiped out a herd of buffalo or a few elephants. What about the Sidewinder rocket? How did that work? Um, I don't know how it worked exactly except that they carried it on sophisticated jet aircraft and it's... Was it it's an infrared seeker or not? Um, I'm not sure how it worked. Of course, it, w it was air to air, meaning that it, that it was uh, uh, propelled and uh, what about the rocketed from the one aircraft and what about the, the other. What about the uh, air to surface missiles? Was there, was well, there, there was the surface to air, the SAM missiles in North Vietnam, and they, uh, of course, were heat seeking. They tracked uh, heat seeking and there's also radar guided and uh, they tracked the American jet aircraft at vastly superior speeds to the to the speed the jets could fly. Was there any escape? Uh, there, was, there was only one way of escaping it. We used to fly, we used to call the SAM missiles the uh, flying telegraph poles and that aptly describes them. Wow. And I've seen them on, because they're about as big as a telegraph pole and uh, uh, I've seen them on film of course I've never seen them personally uh, and they would track the American jet aircraft, uh, overtaking it at a great rate of knots, and the only way was for the pilot at the last moment, that is within the, at when he judged that he had about one second before the missile hit his aircraft, was to throw his aircraft either to one side or the other violently.
Now, if he went two seconds before, he, it, it was still time for the rocket to change direction and track him again. Uh, and, of course, one second was not much time to, to respond. What about the helicopters? They would have been quite vulnerable to uh, rockets. Yes, of course, they flew only over the south, generally speaking. Uh, rescue helicopters went over the north, but uh, thousands and thousands of American helicopters flew in the south. And they became vulnerable in 1972, during the spring offensive of 1972, to a...